Morning, everybody. So this is uh, chapter three lecture on JavaScript essentials, and uh, you know, current current president of the United States is a Donald Trump, and in his early days, he used to go around saying this is this is huge, right? A huge, everything was huge, and uh, that's how I would describe this chapter. But, but not in any sort of like exaggerated sense. This chapter is huge. No exaggerating. Okay, I mean, that, I mean this very seriously. So, so as I asked of all of you yesterday, hopefully you got a chance to read the chapter uh, before, before today. Uh, I'm going to have Discord on here yeah i'm gonna stream it sorry guys let's click on that go live so big chapter and so i'm just gonna jump right into it when we look at this chapter what are the big things okay looking at some objectives here uh, we're going to learn this new method, but this is not a big thing as far as this method called is not a number. That's not that's not a big thing for this chapter. Um, the precedence of all these operators. Uh, this is part of the chapter. We'll we'll cover it again. Not not a core concept, I would say. Number three, though, describe the flow control of an if statement that has both if else and else clauses. This if statement is a big deal. If you've seen the if statement before, that's great. If you've never seen it before, it's going to be the first time you see it today. And this, this statement is a big deal in programming. Uh, and we're going to learn the fundamentals of it today. Okay, so, so bullet number three there is uh, what I do I opened up a word document what did I do that for okay number five number five the f describe the flow control of a loop and so when you're talking about programming fundamentals your fo your programming basics you know you're talking about conditional statements like the if and looping statements like they have there on number 5 a for a do while and a while loop so there's a couple different kinds of loops so that's a big deal so an if statement's a big deal these loops are a big deal and number six, a JavaScript array. That's another huge concept. Okay, so this chapter again, uh, for lack of a better way of describing it, is a huge deal and uh, requires triple the amount of effort that you normally put in. Any one of those topics could be a single chapter in itself. So I'm just gonna make up a number and say, Take your normal effort on this chapter and triple it because that's what it needs. That's, that's what it deserves. So you guys have all seen these in math class before. You say if something is greater than something else, if something is less than something else, these are called relational operators and we use them in programming um, especially with these variables and so uh, we're gonna wind up testing our variables and testing our information using these relational operators and so if I look at slide 5 they give some examples. They're testing, it's called a conditional expression. 
An expression is just something that has to be evaluated. And a conditional expression means uh, if this condition is true, you do one thing. If it's false, you do something else. So it evaluates essentially to true or false. So these conditional expressions evaluate to true or false. So you're testing to see if the last name is Hopper. Notice the two equal signs. When we are testing a condition, we're using double equal signs instead of a single equal sign. If you think about a single equal sign, we call that the assignment operator. We put information into a variable using the assignment operator. Okay, We're testing to see if the first name is not Grace. We're testing to see if the month is not zero. If the test score is greater than 100. If the age is less than 18. Okay, So these are all operators. These are all symbols, in other words. These are symbols that we're going to use in our code. Okay, And yeah, I'm going to just kind of jump ahead and show you how this is used. Okay, Because we're really, we're, we're hitting a lot of what I would consider um, like relational operators, these terms, you know, they're just not necessary to learn how to code an if statement. As far as do you need the symbols? Yes, the symbols are necessary, but do you have to know what a relational operator is? I mean, that's just a term uh, for these symbols. Okay. So let's get into, I'm just going to jump ahead because I just feel like this is where we need to start a little bit more. Okay. Programming foundational statement, the if statement. Let me explain what the if statement does. The if statement allows your programs to be smart. As human beings, I like to think that we're smart. Maybe some of us make smarter decisions than others. But as human beings, we get to do that. We get to make decisions every day. And those decisions are based on certain conditions. Right? So, so I'll give you the example. All of you made the decision to get out of bed and go to school today. Okay? under the condition that you learn something, right? So the condition is if you want to learn something, get out of bed and go to school. That's the decision that you got to make, okay? Now you guys, again, you made a decision based on a condition. And as human beings, we do that all the time, okay? You make decisions based on conditions that makes you smart okay the if statement is how our programs how our websites can make decisions based on conditions which makes our programs smart okay so that's what the if statement does allows our it makes our programs smart and, and how makes decisions based on conditions. So here's an if statement. The hardest thing about the if statement is learning the syntax. Learning where do the parentheses go? Where do the symbols go? Where do the curly braces go? Okay, I'm just going to code an if statement a little bit more simply than the slide has. Okay? So I'm just going to make a little thing here. If you guys want to boot up Visual Studio, I'm going to have you guys doing some, some little coding as well. JavaScript if statement. Uh, I guess the first thing to notice is it's lower cased, right? Don't capital. It is, is JavaScript case sensitive? Yes. So lower cased if is how you code an if statement. Okay, we're going to make our program smart. And in my opinion, my opinion here on this topic is not uh, a typical American opinion, right? 
a typical American opinion is not what I'm going to say here, but I realize I'm weird. And so I'm going to, I'm going to give you an opinion here. I'm going to say, okay, let money equals 3000. You got 3000 bucks. If money is less than 5,000, if money is less than 5,000, alert, don't buy the car. Before our programs just run top to bottom, they executed every line of code. But now, I just made my program smart. I made my program make a smart decision because you don't have enough money to buy the car. So you just gotta wait or you gotta save more money. No loans in this, no loans in this scenario. Okay, we don't get, we don't get car loans. That's a smart thing to do, not getting car loans. Okay. Maybe we'll just throw an old alert at the end of the program that says goodbye. <laughs> All right. Well, what happens here? Let's run the program, launch the page. You got a little alert. Do you see that? Don't buy the car. Well, money is 3000 If money is less than $5,000, do not buy the car. But let's change it to 6000 If we change it to 6000 as you might expect, it just skips that statement. It no longer says, don't buy the car. Okay? One of the things that I didn't realize when I was learning the if statement is right away you go from if, and all of a sudden they start talking about if, else, if, else, if, else, else, you know. This else clause, okay? You don't need an else clause. Everyone look at this code right now. Do you see any else's on the screen? There's no else's, okay? An if statement simply says, if this, if this code, if this expression, again, the expression is evaluated to true or false. If this expression is true, if this expression is true, Run the code inside the curly braces. Lines 14 and 16, these are the curly braces. If this expression is true, run the code inside the braces. That's it. That's an if statement. If it's true, then you run something. If it's not true, then you skip it. If it's false, skip the code in the curly braces. That's it. And I'll just kind of condense it all here, one right next to each other. Okay? Now, now do you see why I said, like, we is like, oh... What are the things that you can test? Well, you could test to see if something's equal. You could see if something's not equal. Greater than, less than, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. Welcome to your third grade math class. You're learning these symbols all over again. You're just learning them in the programming world. Okay? If you learned them in third grade, maybe it was fifth grade. What grade was it in? Second grade? What grade were you in? Fourth grade? Okay, it's all the same. It's all the same. You just got to learn them in the programming world. Notice the not equal to is the expression point in equal to. Testing if something is equal to is the double equal sign. That's a common mistake. You will make that mistake in your programming career. If you're, allowed, if you're around for any amount of time, you will accidentally do a single equal sign instead of a double equal sign. Okay, that's just a common, common mistake. Okay. What goes, so, so those are the relational operators. Then what goes in the parentheses? Okay, we got the keyword if, and then we got a set of parentheses. 
Inside of the parentheses is your conditional expression. Eh, what does that mean? That just means something that is going to be true or false. Right? It's going to be true or false. If it's true, you run the code in the curlies. If it's false, you skip the code in the curlies. It's that simple. Correct. There's no, there's no else that's mandatory. Okay. Now, now there is an else statement. What is the else? Well, the else comes after the if, and I'll put a little comment on the else. This is the code that you run if for the false condition. What do we have right now? Well, we only had a true condition. And if it was true, you ran the code. Otherwise, you skipped the code. Okay. Now we have a scenario. If it's true, run this code. If you put an else now, notice I'm going to delete this. Because notice if it's, you, well, you still skip this. You still skip this. I'm going to hit full screen. There we go. Okay, so if money is less than five thousand, don't buy the car. Otherwise, alert. You can buy the car if you pay cash. No loans. Okay, so we got six thousand bucks. If the money is less than five thousand, you don't buy the car. Otherwise, you get a message that says, you can buy the car if you pay cash. And then it says goodbye. Notice the output. You can buy the car if you pay cash. You got 6,000 bucks. Then it says, it says goodbye. Notice it says goodbye no matter what. If I say 4,000 bucks, again, we're going to go back to don't buy the car. And it says goodbye. It says goodbye no matter what. Right? Goodbye is not part of our if or, or our else. Okay? So our, our scenario, our scenario is pretty simple. You got one of two paths, right? Either, either you got enough money or you don't. Okay? So why don't you guys take a take a minute to code? Um, you know, make a variable called age, and say if the age is greater than or equal to twenty one, welcome to the venue. If it's greater than or equal to twenty one, welcome to the venue. If they're under twenty one, then tell them go home. Okay. So so write some code. Write a JavaScript statement. If they are 21 or older, welcome them to the venue. Otherwise, tell them to go home. I'm going to pause the recording because there's no point in recording this uh, pause time. Okay, folks. Um, so let's let's do this one, right? So I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, let age equals 21. If age is greater than or equal to 21, alert, welcome to the venue. Else, go home. Okay, so again, the if, this becomes our true This is our true block. A block of code just is anything inside of curly braces, right? So if this evaluates to true, run our true block. So the if becomes the true, the true block. 
the else is the false block. The if is the true block. The else is the false block. Again, you do not need the else. It just it just uh, sorry, I got sidetracked. Uh, it's there in case you need to run code in case something is false. All right, so right now it'll say welcome to the venue and we don't have a goodbye at the very end. Uh, the, the, the point of putting the goodbye at the very end is just to show you line 22 runs no matter what because it's not inside of, a, of an if statement. And then if I would say something above here, Welcome to my uh, page, whatever. This one also runs no matter what. So now it says, uh, let's refresh the page here. I refresh the page. It says, welcome to my page. That runs no matter what. Then it says, welcome to the venue. Then it says, goodbye. If I change the person's age to be anything less than 21, welcome to my page. Then it says, go home. Goodbye. Uh, Drew is asking about uh, instead of doing an alert printed to a council, so there is a there is a council built into your browser, but you're still going to have to launch the page. Um, there's a council inside of the uh, inside of the the uh, browser, and instead of doing alert to get the message to go to the council, you would do council dot log which is a lower C and instead of doing alerts we, we could put all of this in a council dot log yeah and then there you go Troy gave an alternate method there there you go. Okay, to run it in Visual Studio. Cool. All right. Let's now let's test against a string. So we'll say let first name equals Evan. I'm gonna get rid of the alerts before and after. So we could test a numeric value. Now we're testing against a string. If first name double equals Evan, welcome to the venue, otherwise go home. Now notice I didn't capitalize first name the same. That would not work. Um, if I run this, that's how we test, that's how we test a string. You can do some math in here. Um, let me comment this out temporarily. If num1 plus 100 equals 101,
So here we have an expression. We're saying, okay, add 1 to 100. Does that work? And you get the output. It worked. So again, these are all conditional expressions. The conditional expressions are just what goes inside the parentheses. So you have the keyword if followed by parentheses. And what goes in those parentheses has to evaluate to true or false. Another common mistake is people on line 24, they want to put semicolons right here. Okay, That's, that's not where a semicolon goes. That is a mistake uh, that will cause a bug. Okay, it will, it will cause an error in your code. Okay, The if is lower cased. This evaluates to true or false. If it's true, it runs this block of code, 25 through 27. Okay. If it's false, it runs 29 through 31. Now, these curly braces are sometimes optional. Watch what happens. I can delete these curly braces. They are sometimes optional. See, those curly braces are now gone. Notice it still worked. Sometimes they're optional, but not all the time. So when are they optional and when are they not? You notice how I only have one statement inside of each block of code. When there's only one JavaScript statement inside of a block of code, that's when they're optional. Remember that statements end in semicolons, right? So notice even when I code two statements without curly braces, what happens? It even gives you a little error message, okay? So basically what that boils down to is for me, I always put curly braces because you never know. You might want to add statements later on. Okay, so even when I have one statement, I still include the curly braces because you might add statements later on, even though it's optional with one statement inside of the curly braces, okay? So the short version here is I put the curlies in. Now, let's talk about white space. Some people prefer the curly braces like this. Okay, in fact, what do you do there? I just deleted two line breaks from my code. So I condensed the vertical space down and it's now taking up less space. Okay. It kind of goes back to It, it comes back to depending on where you work, they might have different coding styles. This is this is just a coding style. So for me as a teacher, I prefer this because it's very vertically easy to see what's lining up. Okay, so my coding style as a teacher is to put the curly braces like this. Even though most people that do this on a regular basis view this as a waste of space. Both of them work. They function just the same. It's just a waste of space. I mean, in reality, you could do this. That would technically work, okay? It's super condensed, okay? Although it's not as readable, I would argue. 
Okay. So for the sake of learning and readability, I like this. This to me is very clean. My advice to you all is just pick a style and stick with it. Kind of like the camel casing that we talked about last chapter or the underscore notation. Just pick one and stick with it. So we done, we've done all of these. We've done double equals, uh, greater than, less than, greater than or equal to. We didn't do not equal to, but you could... Whoops, hold on, give me a sec. My screen's glitching out. There we go. You guys still with me on Discord? My docking station kind of glitched out on me there. It's still glitching out. You guys with me on Discord? No, oh, it's still glitching out. Okay. Good. Um, the not equal to, I'll bring this one back. If you're now, if your name is not equal to Evan, you're welcome to the venue. Otherwise, you go home. Right? So that's that's not equal to. Notice my name is Evan, so it tells me to go home. <laughs> Be careful with not equal to. People's brains don't work naturally when you say it's something not equal to something. Not equal to always takes a little bit of extra like, okay, what is it What is it really saying here? If your name is not equal to Evan, you're welcome to the venue. Again, I just don't think it's a natural way of thinking for most people. Okay, so just be a little careful with the not equal to. If you can code it another way, that, that would be preferred. Almost like a double, yeah, something like a double negative. Uh, not not going to the store kind of thing. Uh, so, my name is Evan. Is Evan is not equal to Evan? That's false. <laughs> right? That's kind of the no, double negative that Drew's talking about there. Is Evan e not equal to Evan? This is false. Because my name is Evan. So it runs, go home. See what I mean? It's, it's, it's kind of weird. I feel like the less you think about it, the more sense it makes. So that's right. Don't overthink it because that's where it goes. <laughs> that's right. Think about it less. Is the name not Evan? Well, then run the other block of code. Again, at, from, from a high level, from a high level, what do if statements do? They make our programs smart, right? Amazon.com is full of if statements, right? Microsoft Windows 10, whoever coded Windows 10 is full of if statements. You pick your favorite video game, it's full of if statements. The favorite app on your cell phone is full of if statements. Any application that's ever been coded in the modern history is full of if statements. Okay? If there is software that's been written, it's got if statements in it. Okay? So that's how, uh, again, fundamental this is. It allows these computers to be told what to do under certain conditions. And they have to follow the logic. Okay, so a couple functions that we've covered so far is like the alerts and the prompt. And these are, I say functions or methods, the terms are kind of used interchangeably. Basically, uh, a, a behavior, something that is caused to happen. There's another function that's introduced into this chapter called is not a number. If Evan or let's just say first name, 
is not a number So this function is not a number will return true or false. It will it will uh, that's right. It's a it's a way of validating data. And is not a number returns true or false and it can be used in an if statement to validate your data. Cuz what you don't want to do is try and like do some math. Okay, I'm going to change my variable to be called some number. And if if it's if it stores a string, you're going to say a number is needed. Otherwise, some number times 100. So you can see because whoop, now this is interesting. I got my first error. First name is not defined. Do you see what I did there to check my error? I went to inspect, then I clicked on council. And it says first name is not defined. Well, why? Because I changed my variable from some number. It was first name. I changed it to some number. So I need to change my if statement to some number. So if some number is not a number, give them an error message. Otherwise, use that number. It says a number is needed. All right, now let's go ahead and put in the number 10. Now it does 10 times 100 is 1,000. So that's how we use this function is not a number. Question for you, since I don't have to associate it with an object, what object does it belong to? What is our global object? Window, correct. So isNAM belongs to window. Just like alert and just like prompt. Oh, uh, let's see here. How are we doing? We're doing good. Everyone doing good so far? If statement? Is nan is a function. Now what happens if I wrap, like if I put, um, if I put some number in quotes? Well, that's, that's not a number, right? So that, what we have in quotes is a string. So it'll tell us a number is needed. A number is needed. But what happens if I put a number in quotes, like the number 10? But it's in quotes. So what does that do? It's actually smart enough to figure it out. It'll look inside of the string, even though it's in quotes, it'll look inside of the string, see if it's a number, and evaluate it to a number. So that is NAND is actually smart enough, even if you got something in quotes, if that something in quotes is a string, it will return uh, that it is not a number. So 10 in quotes, this returns false, so it does the math 10 times 100. Okay, do you see why I just wanted to skip ahead? Because it's like, Just let's just get some basics down on the if statement. Because now we've got what are called logical operators. Let's look at logical operators. These are just what they what what they call compound expression. Um, let age equals twenty one. Let money equals thousand. If age is greater than or equal to twenty one, and 
money is greater than 500, now now you got a this is an expensive uh, what do they call that like door door uh, <sighs> What do you call it? Cover, thank you. you <laughs> when you pay to get into a, a restaurant or a, a, like a music venue. Welcome to the music venue. You got an expensive cover. Gosh. I'm out of it. I'm out of it. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Some, some, uh, some places in Las Vegas, I mean, they could charge... You can charge quite a bit of money. So what do we have here? Now we have an and. Both of these have to be true. So the way that these and sand works, and if you've ever studied uh, circuitry, like uh, electrical circuits, like you're wiring up... Uh, electrical circuits they've got uh, gates and it works the same way as the and electrical gate and so both of these there's there's two expressions now there's an expression to the left and there's an expression to the right both expressions to the left and the expression to the right have to be true in order for this to run if either one of these is false then the else block runs. So if we play this, we get welcome to the music venue. Now let's say that we've only got 400 bucks. It tells us to go home. Right? Because the right side of the expression becomes false. And with the and sign, oh, by the way, there is such a thing of a single and sign, okay, versus a double. The short thing is you always coded a double. So just pretend like I never said that. There is no single and sign. The double is a more efficient, better way of coding, okay? So just pretend like you didn't learn that. There's no single, there's only a double, okay? This is the and symbol. There's also an or, there's an or symbol. Now this might be a little shady, right? Now, if you're over 21, welcome to the venue. Or if you got more than 500 bucks, welcome to the venue. Right? You guys have never done that before. I'm sure no one in this class has ever bribed a doorman. You're not that kind of people. Welcome to the music venue. What does this one mean? The or means either the age has to be true or the money situation has to be true. Either one of those gets you into the music venue. So again, what are these called? These are called logical operators. The and, the or, and the not. The not just the not just screws with it. Again, I try and avoid the not because it's almost like one of those double negatives. You can put a not symbol right like this. It's going to evaluate age greater than 21. That'll be true. And then the not would flip it to false. So this is, you could write this in different ways if age is not equal to, or uh, not greater than 21, if, or if just age is less than 21. Um, there is no, there is no, excuse me, there is no not greater than 21. That's simply less than. <laughs> So 
this logical operator just takes what this would be and flips it the other way. Again, I try and avoid this. However, you do see this, this not operator out there. Um, you, you see it out there. It just, it just is. Can't avoid it. So here's uh, here's examples of using the ands and the ors and the not. The not takes the highest precedence because it's always just going to take the result and flip it. Um, then you then you do basically you do the ors first, then you do the ands, then you do the nots. That's kind of how that operates. You do the or first, then the ands, then the nots. Let's let's do an example of this. Okay, you do the ors first, then you do the ands. Uh, I'm gonna add a third variable here. Let So here it does the or first, even though it's left to right. Let me, it does the or first. 21, so the age is 21, that's true. So this or becomes true. And then it says, and fun is true. So this will get you into the venue. So you're 21 years old, you got 400 bucks and you're fun. So it's going to go age greater than or equal to 21. That is true. Or money is 500. Well, that's, this is false, but this evaluates to true first. So we got true on the left and true on the right. So this should welcome us to the music venue. If I were to say fault fun is false, that's then going to kick us out. Why? I got that backwards. That's why. It evaluates the and first. So the you don't come across these all too often, but that's why I wanted to walk through this. Fun is false, so the and becomes false. So that's operated first, and then the or. So it is in order, and, and then the or. The and gets operated first. Fun is false, so that's false on the right. But then age is still 21, so you still can get in because then it becomes true this evaluates to false but this evaluates to true so it becomes true or false which allows you in yeah you'd have to you'd have to rearrange this to be something like that So this would be evaluated first, this would be false, and this would still be true, so it would still evaluate to true. You'd have to change, yeah, yeah, the and would have to be first. So let's do that. You don't come across these complex scenarios all too often. See, this money less than 400 is still true. Money is greater than. There it goes. Okay, so we've kind of 
beat this into the ground. It's a little bit more complex than you typically see. You typically don't write, especially uh, as, as we're new and learning, the scenarios don't get this complex. But there is an order of precedence that's worth remembering. Uh, at least that there is an order of precedence between the and and the or. Okay, da, 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 da. we already tested a Boolean variable to kind of show that again. Let fun equals true. You could say if you're fun, well, fun is true. If you're fun, alert, welcome to the venue. So you could just test a variable inside of your if statement. If that variable is a Boolean variable, then that will work. There it goes. Okay, that chunk of theory can be an entire chapter in itself. Okay, we got through that in about 50 minutes. Okay, I try and take a break every 50 minutes or so. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's take a break. I'll pause the recording now. We are back recording. We are on part two of three of this lecture. Uh, three parts that could each be their own chapter. The first being the if statement. And I would say we didn't, we didn't cover that if statement in its depth, in its entirety. Okay, we certainly left some parts off. There's more to it. There's definitely more to it than we covered, but this is just kind of like your first exposure. So for your, for your sanity, we're going to move on to another statement. This other statement, these other statements are loops.htm. Loops make your programs powerful. If statements, if statements, Make your program smart. So if statements, you get to make decisions. Loops. Why do I, what do I mean by they make them powerful? Well, you can write a little bit of code. You can write just a little bit of code. And it does a whole lot. So a little bit of code can perform quite a bit on your web page. It can do a lot, okay? So that, that's what makes it powerful. So, so the web page might be doing a lot, but it's all just done in a loop. It's just doing something repetitively, right? That's what a loop is, doing something repetitively. Okay, the first loop that they cover here is a while loop. So let's talk about a while loop. All right, there's three parts that are important of a while loop. Number one, declare and assign a value to a control variable. So part of a while loop, you have to have a variable that's called the control variable that controls the number of loops. So we're going to have a control variable that, okay, are you looping this one time? Are you looping through it 10 times? Are you looping through it 100, 1,000, 10,000, a million? Okay, each time you loop, you call that an iteration, right? So you might hear me use the term, how many times does that loop iterate? Okay, so I'll just call this, you could call it the control variable. It's really commonly just called I. I don't know why. Uh, it, I guess I for iteration. 
index. Index. So we'll call i is 1. But really, what's an index? It's position. Yeah. It's position in the loop. So, so what do we do here? We declared, which is done with let, and we assigned a value to it. So i is our control variable. That's just what we're going to call it. We're going to call it our control variable. Uh, I got a student I got to talk to real quick. Let me hold that thought and pause. Okay, so step number one, declare and assign a value to a control variable. Step number two, a testing the control variable. This is, this is inside of the loop. Testing the control variable. Um, yeah. While i is less than 10. This is the loop body, by the way, inside of the curly braces. Oops. Oh my gosh, I was like, I noticed something here. My comments are all done in HTML. It's because I didn't have the script tag. Okay, the body of the loop is, is right here between lines 16 and 18. So we have to test the control variable. i is less than 10. Is 1 less than 10? Yes, it is. That's true. This is kind of like an if statement. If this is true, then you go inside the body. But here it's not an if it's true. It's while it's true. Which means as long as this is true, continue to loop, continue to run this body over and over and over. Okay, that's the loop. While something is true, again, I mean, the, the parentheses are the same as an if. There's a, a, a test expression, just like an if, but it's a while keyword instead of, of an if. I'll just say alert hello. Now, again, there's three important parts. I've shown you the first two. If I leave that third part out, what's going to happen here is an infinite loop. That loop just runs infinitely, and actually, typically what happens is this is going to time out and crash. Okay? So what happens here? 1 less than 10. Is 1 less than 10? Yes, it says hello. 1 is still less than 10. It says hello. 1 is still less than 10. It says hello. You get what I'm saying. 1 is less than 10. Say hello. 1 is less than 10. Say hello. So what do we got to do? We have to then, to break the infinite loop, the third important piece, modify the control variable. We could say i++. Plus plus. What does i++ plus plus do? Yeah, it takes it up by 1. So it goes from 1 to 2. So each time I'll say hello plus i. So I'll say hello 1, hello 2, hello 3. That's... Now i is being changed every time through the loop. Now it says hello 1, hello 2. And the last one you see is 9. Why is that? Well, 9 is less than 10. It'll say hello 9. I will go to 10. Is 10 less than 10? No, 10 is not less than 10. So that means this loop is false. Or 
Line 22 runs after the while loop when the while loop becomes false. Uh, lines 23 and after run when the while loop becomes false. So if we run this again, hello one, hello two, three, eh, eh, eh. work with me. Gotta click it just right. There we go. There it says goodbye. All right, so let's do this. Instead of doing an alert, I'm going to put a paragraph into my HTML with an ID of result. I want you guys to code this up real quick. So all I did is I took it out of an alert and I just put the output into a paragraph. Oh, don't make my mistake of putting the script above, put your script at the bottom. Put your script at the bottom of the body. Remember that's the best practice. And I'm gonna take the alert out. You can leave the comments out to shorten it up. I'm going to pause the recording. So I just un unpaused. Um, we're still just, uh, what we're doing now is we're messing with the while loop and we're just getting it to do different things. Right now we got it printing out our numbers one through 100 and they're all on their own line. Do you see how this is executing something repetitively though? You kind of get the feel for what the while loop is doing. Okay, this is just learning the, the basic foundations. My question is, how do you print out every other number? And I'm kind of waiting on someone to think this through. Anyone on Discord? Increment it twice. Okay, there's one solution. I plus plus, I plus plus. There's one solution. Increment it twice. Okay, now we go one, three, five, seven, nine, so on and so forth. Is there a way to add two to I without just having two lines of code? No, there's not There's not like an even or odd tag. But how do we increment I by two? Instead of saying I plus plus, I plus plus, could we not say I plus equals two? So notify, notice how we're modifying the control variable and now we're just adding two to I every time. There we go. So right now we're printing out odd numbers one through 100. What if I wanted it to be even numbers? How would I, how would I, how would I print out even numbers? Okay, let's start I off at zero. If we start I off at zero, it prints out zero. That's correct, we're getting all of our even numbers, but what if I want to get rid of that zero? I don't want it to print out zero. Then what do I do? Yeah, we'll start I at two. Do you see how I'm just tweaking the different parts here? I'm tweaking the control variable. I'm tweaking the test. 
I'm tweaking the modification of the control variable. I said there's three important parts, and all I'm doing is modifying those three parts, and that's going to modify the, the, the loop itself and what the output is. See that? That's why I'm that's why we're going through these scenarios is just learning the different the different pieces. What if I wanted to print out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100? What are we gonna do to print out just tens? We're going to change a 2 to a 10. Okay, we're going to change this 2 to a 10. All right. And we're going to start off I at 10. There we go. Those are the important pieces of a while loop. Now, a while loop is known as a pretest loop. Why is it called a pretest loop? Well, look what happens if I if I set i to 101, is my loop going to iterate at all at this point? No. It's a pretest loop because it tests it tests your control variable before the body ever iterates. So a while loop is called a pretest loop because this test runs before the body runs. Which is a forecasting for foreshadowing for a do while loop. There are other loops in JavaScript besides a while loop. Loops make the program powerful, whether it's a while loop, a do while loop, or what we're going to talk about after this is called a for loop. They all do the same thing. They loop, they iterate, they just run code repetitively. There's just small differences between them. A do while loop still has the same three important parts. Declare and assign a control variable. Let i equal to 1. Test the control variable. This is done with a do. Whoa. That was a typo. You know what? I forgot my darn script tag again. All right, though, let's look at this one. This one's called the do while. We got the keyword do followed by our curly braces, our body of the loop, if you will. And then the while, this is where we test. This is where we test on line 20. We test the control variable on line 20. Let's go ahead and put our paragraph back in here. Idea of result.
What are we forgetting? Part three, which is what? What's the third part? Declare a control variable, test the control variable, modify the control variable. I starts off at 1. Do this while i is less than 10 and continue to loop until the while becomes false. So what's the difference? Why, why do we need this other loop? I mean, what's the difference between a while loop and a do while loop? Remember I said the while loop is a pretest. This is a post test loop. Notice what happens if I set i equal to 100. It's still a do while loop. It will always run the loop body one or more times. So it's a post-test loop. It doesn't test the condition until after the body. Whereas a while loop, it tests the condition before the body. So let me let me back up here. So i is 1. If I, if I take a look at the output, it looks very much like a, a while loop would. But what happens if I set i to 101? Well, 101 is clearly not less than 10 but it's still going to print out i to the screen one time because that body of the loop will run one time. Okay, so in the real world, some things run zero or more times, some things happen or need to occur zero or more times, and if that, needs, if, if that thing needs to occur zero or more times, then you might use a while loop. If whatever you need to do needs to happen one or more times, then you use a do while loop. Okay? And that's that's the difference. They both loop. I mean, they're executing code repetitively. That's what a loop is. Okay? One's a pretest, one's a post test. And and that's the difference. They have the same three parts and they work kind of the same way. You know, just with one big difference. Which leads us to our third loop. Again, I've coded this enough to know that, like, if you're following along, you're probably like, oh, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense, that makes sense. I know that you don't know this stuff until you do it. Like that's, that's what it boils down to. You're going to have to do this several times and like solve some problems and be confused by this a couple times and like get stumped and then figure something out. Yeah, and so Drew, um, it says I'm unclear when to use each loop. It just depends on the scenario that you're in. If the scenario, the real world scenario, the problem that you're solving requires the behavior to run one or more time, then it's a, a do while. If it needs to run zero or more times, then it's a while. So just does, does the code in the body need to run at least once? It's very situational based on the problem that you're solving. That's correct. Now, let's let me let me kind of code up this uh, this book example to see how, another way that this could be used. Just by you know, all I'm doing is spitting numbers out on the screen. That's not really useful, right? So how might this be used? 
uh, let's do this thing while this occurs. So let's do this. Um, let number number equals prompt enter a number. while if what they're typing is not a number we're going to continue to ask them for the number in other words if they give me a letter I'll reprompt them right so so we can use this loop to continually prompt them until they give us a number So if I type in a letter, until I type in three, then we're done. Right? So here's, here's a scenario where we could use a loop to continually ask the user for valid input. Right? So one scenario in the real world that you could use loops for is data validation. Another scenario, a real world scenario, right, that you use loops for, let me pull up a website here. Uh, this, this is funny. Oh. Well, you guys can see my Amazon. I just bought this book. Bill Gates just came out with the book, How to Avoid Climate Disaster. It's on pre-order. Eh, Bill Gates is a smart man. I bought this. You now see some of my shopping habits. Okay. Go on Amazon, and I'm going to search for a basketball. Okay. How many results of basketball do you think I got? Pages and pages and pages of people trying to sell me basketball and basketball equipment. Okay, so another scenario where loops are commonly used, and I'll just try and simplify this, right? So I hit Amazon's database full of products. Amazon has a database full of products, millions of products, okay? And they might return a thousand products, okay? And so they're going to print out one product at a time on this page in a loop. So there might be a thousand products that need to be printed on the page, a thousand results that return of images and everything else, text and everything else. And they're going to use a loop to print out one product at a time, every product printed in a row until there's no more room, then go down to the next row. Okay. So this is a very repetitive process. Take this item from the database and put it on the screen and continually do that in a loop over and over and over again until, until there's no more products, right? So, so another very common real world scenario where, where loops are used. All right. The last kind of loop that we're going to learn about today is a for loop. Here's what I like about a for loop. There are still three important parts. The same three parts. The three important parts are all together in one place. Now if I go back to my, my do while,
let's assume that this script is a thousand lines long, which, you know, in real world, your scripts are pretty long. This variable declaration, <clears throat> which by the way, notice I didn't assign it, so it's just a declaration that you need. The declaration could happen on line number five. The The test could happen on line 500. And the modification of the control variable could happen on, so if this was line 5, this was line 500, this could be line 200. Okay, so what you got to imagine is just is these different pieces could be spread out all over the place. Okay, and it could be hard to troubleshoot if there's a problem. Right? You, you would have to, it would have to take some time to kind of hunt down the different pieces. The benefit of a for loop is that all the three important parts are all together on one line. Here's what the for loop looks like. Here we're declaring our control variable, we're testing our control variable, and we're modifying our control variable all on one line. So you don't have to go hunting for the different pieces. They're all condensed into one place. They're nice and tidy all in one place. Now, the way this runs when I was a new programming student, I didn't realize, because there's actually, look at this. What does a semicolon mean? That's a statement. So there's three different statements going on here. Okay. What happens first is you declare the control variable, then you test it, then you run the loop body, then you increment. Isn't that weird? The first time I saw that, I was like, wait a minute, you don't go from here, here, to here? No, you don't. You don't go from one, two, three. You go one, two, then you run the body of the loop, then you increment, then you go back to the test, then you run the body if it's true, if the test is still true, then you increment, then you test. If it's true, then you go to the body, and this is the loop. You see what I'm kind of drawing on the screen? Okay, so so again, for those on Discord, I was just on the projector, but here, this happens first, let equals I, then the test, then the body, then the increment, then the test, then the body, then the increment, then the test, then the body. So let's do the same kind of deal as we were doing before. So we just printed out using a for loop, one through nine. These are also called pretest loops because if I is 100, this loop will never run. Notice the body of the loop never ran. Because I is 100, 100 is not less than 10, so this never runs. So let's go through our scenarios. I is 1. 1 is less than 10, we get 1 through 9. Again, I'm going to go through the same scenarios. How do I get it to print out 1 through 10? No, no, there's not, Drew. It's just a pretest. That's, that's the only 
The only post-test loop that there is is a do while. Um, so so how do I get how do I get this to print out 10 as well? It's the same answer as before, which is what did we do last time? Remember, Trevion, you said, well, make it less than 11, right? And Danny, you said, make it equal to 10. Right? So now we got out 1 through 10. Then my next question was, well, how do I get it to be every other number? How do we get it to be every other number? Incremented by 2. What does that look like? Instead of I plus plus, it's going to be I plus equals 2. I plus equals 2. Now we're printing out 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Yes, sir. Ah. Uh. How do I get it to print out even numbers then instead of printing out odd numbers right now? I want it to print out 2 through 10. Let's start it off at 0. Let's see what happens. Now it's printing out 0 through 10. What if I wanted to just start at 2? Let's change that to a 2. What if I want it to be 2 through 1,000? How do I get it to print out even numbers 2 through 1,000? Yeah, let's just change the 10 to 1,000. You notice it took a little bit more time that time. But look at all that. Can we break it? 10,000? The faster your computer, the faster this runs. I got a pretty fast computer. Or maybe I don't. <laughs> there it goes. Trevor? Yeah. Even numbers through 10,000. Um, if you accidentally cause an infinite loop like that, I plus two, you're not reassigning I. So let's kind of, let's take a step back to last chapter. What is, what is I plus equals two? Let's, let's first talk about that. So if I say, if I say let I equals one, I equals I plus 5. Okay, so, so what we're doing here is we're saying the new value of I is equal to 1 plus 5. So the new value of I is equal to 6. All right, 
A shorthand, a, a shorthand for this is I plus plus equals five. Okay, line twelve right here, and this comment I plus equals five is the same thing. You made four of them during this lecture for my lab. Four yeah, loops. <laughs> you were using loop for loops in your lab, yeah. <laughs> so that's what plus equals is. Plus equals is appending or, or increasing the value by by five, taking the current value and increasing it by five. So that's what we're doing here. So if you come across this, check this out. If you come across this and you just say i plus two. You're not increasing i by 2, and you're going to notice the browser just kind of spinning. If you notice the browser just spinning and spinning and spinning, you probably have an infinite loop. In other words, you didn't modify the control variable properly. So that's infinite loops are bad, and the short, the short thing is let's look at our control variable, and that's, that was the problem. All right. They also call this a count controlled loop because you could typically look at this. You could look at a for loop and you could tell how you could you could tell how many iterations it's going to go. In other words, I'm not putting like a a test for a variable is not a number in here. Like I did on my do while, my do while I was testing an isnan function in here. And you're, you're not doing that in this for loop. I, typically in this for loop, you can look at this and you can say, well, I got, I got 5,000 iterations that this loop is going to iterate. You can calculate it, right? Do the math. Right? Um... You could do something like I plus equal or uh, sum. Let's do let sum I don't know why I got this let I equals one up here. That was not supposed to be there at any point during this for loop. Um, let's take sum plus equals I. So what's what's sum gonna do? Sum's gonna start off at sum's gonna start off at zero. The first time through the loop, sum adds in two. The second time it adds in four, then it adds in six, then it adds in eight, then it adds in ten. So what's two plus four plus six plus eight plus ten? Two plus four is six, plus six is twelve plus 8 is 20, plus 10 is 30, so i becomes 30 by the time you're done through the loop, and you output the sum. So it should output 30 to the screen. How is that useful? Oh, you read a bunch of daily sales for, for the week, right? You got, you got seven days in a week. You read in each daily sale, and you want to sum all of them together. Right, so you got seven days worth of sales, you add them all together, you use a loop, you add them all together, and you accumulate a total. Right? So what they what they call this sum is an accumulator. Right? Because it's it's accumulating a, a bigger total every time through the loop. Okay. I didn't lie to you guys when I said this was a big lecture. It's a big, lots of topics. Or would I say it was huge. So we're going to take our next break. Let's take 15 minutes. Recording is unpaused. Discord is active.
we are on to the third major topic of this lecture, which is a concept called arrays. Again, this could be a chapter in itself. And when it comes to the first two topics, the if statements and the loops, we're, we're brazing the surface, right? They definitely, the concepts can go deeper than we've covered. But since, since the subject material is so broad, you can only go an inch deep. Like if you're going a mile wide, you can only go an inch deep. Okay, if we went a mile deep on every one of these subjects, uh, we would be here until about Monday morning, right? So we got a mile wide, but we're going an inch deep on each one of these. Um, so third subject is an array. So what is an array? Well, a variable holds a single piece of information. Uh, an array holds multiple pieces of information. Okay, so if we were to go into a program and say we've got a thousand students. By the way, does that look a lot better on the projector? Should have done that a while ago. Arrays.html. And if I were to have a script... And let's just say I've got a thousand students. And so I'm going to start storing information on all of my students. Uh, student one, student two, student three. You want to do that a thousand times? No, probably not. Okay, then let's say, let's say so we're going down this path. We're going to say student one is Bob. Student two is Jan. Student three is Bill. You get where I'm going? So declaring a thousand students would be tedious. Assigning a thousand students would be tedious. And then outputting so here we're declaring variables to hold our data here we're inserting data and then here we're outputting data Those are like the three parts, right? Declare variables to store the data, put data into the variables, get the data back out. And if we got a thousand students, each one of these is a tedious process. And just, you know, just for the sake of this, you know, that's that's all we did is we output the data to the screen. Granted, it's not pretty. So is there a better way? Yes, there is. And that is an array. Array, an array is a storage unit that can store many pieces of data. And Let's take a look at this. So let's say let students, I'm going to make it plural because it's going to hold many, equals new array with a thousand students. We now declared 
variables in an array to hold our data. So what we were doing here on line 14, we just did here on line 29. Except for there's a thousand, now there's a thousand students. You know, Rankin has 2,000 students. You want 2,000 students? Boom, you got 2,000 students. Which one do you want to do? I'll tell you which one I want to do. I want to use the arrays. Because when you got a lot of data, and trust me, programs have a lot of data. Arrays are just easier and more efficient. I mean, from a from a um, performance point of view, not only is it faster for you to type this, but it's faster for the computer to, to, to operate, to do an array than it is for the computer to have a thousand different variables. It's literally more efficient from the processor's point of view. Well, now, how do we get data? How do we insert data into an array? This is, from a coding standpoint, easier, but I'm going to have to explain it, which is, is, is going to look like it's not as efficient. Okay, so for me to explain this, it's not going to be efficient, but then I'll simplify it and, and make it efficient. Okay, so the name of our array is called students. So the first student, you might think, is at position one. It's done with these brackets. Okay, these, these are brackets. Who's our first student? Bob? You might think that our, our first student would be student one, as is in brackets. Programmers, though, were, were weird because computers start their count at zero. Programmers think that they want to start their count at zero. So it's just always the thing. We start our count at zero. So the first student isn't actually student one. It's actually student zero. The second student, then, this is just weird, but it is what it is. If programmers were in charge of the elevator, the, the first floor would be the zero floor. It's just screwy. You see what I'm doing here? Now, you might argue that really this is no more efficient than what we were doing before, right? And I would agree. I would agree with that, but luckily there's a better process. I'm just showing you how to put data into an array. This says the first student holds the value Bob. The second student holds Jan. The third student holds Bill. What is the last student then in this, in this structure? If there's, if there's 2,000 students, what is the last student position? Yeah, 1999. Student 1999 equals the last person. Because you start the count at one, the last person is one less than the number of total students. Because you started, you start the count at zero. Did I say start the count at one? You start the count at zero. So if you've got 10 things, the count is zero through nine. If you've got 50 things, the count is 0 through 49. If you've got 1,000 things, it's 0 through 999. Right? It's always one less than. Okay. Now if we're going to output the data... Again, this doesn't really look like any more efficient.
declare the array, put data into the array, get data out of the array. Uh, typo. This is my student's array. But, like I said, there's a more efficient way here. So the question becomes, how do we do a repetitive task in JavaScript? A loop. Yeah. Wasn't there a loop that we called a count-controlled loop? Which one did we call a count-controlled loop? An accumulator was a, a variable that goes up through a loop, but uh, that the the for loop. I think I, I think I called it a count controlled loop, but I'll, I'll give you the answer. The for loop is a count controlled loop. Remember, I said a for loop was a count controlled loop because you can count the number of iterations. You can literally do the math and count them. So going back to arrays, we're going to use a loop in conjunction with are arrays. Now this is going to be this is going to be a combination of two important topics in one place. Okay? We're going to say let i equals 0. We start i at 0 because remember the first position the first position is position 0. So that's why we start i at 0. We're going to say i less than students dot length. The length of students is however many students there are. In this case there's 2,000 students. Now there's 200 students. Now there's two students. Okay, I'm just gonna make it, we'll make it three. Let's just say there's three students. So we're starting our count at zero while i is less than three Increment i by 1. How do we put information in the first student? We say students, and then inside these brackets we use a, what number are we going to put in for the first student? Zero. Student sub zero equals prompt enter a student name. Now if I if, if that's my loop, okay, and I'm looping that, all you're doing is you're changing that first student's name. I'm gonna change this from student sub zero. Isn't there a variable that holds a value of zero? And then when it goes through the loop, it's going to go from zero to one, and from one to two. And so instead of saying student sub zero, I'm going to say student sub i. We're going to use the control variable to control the value that's in these brackets. So the, the first time through the loop, this will be student sub 0. The second time through the loop, this will be student sub 1. The third time through the loop, this will be student sub 2. All right. So now instead of having kind of this process where we had to manually insert it all in, 
we're doing two things here. We're using a loop. So if we had a thousand students, this loop would now loop a thousand times. But we're going to keep it, you know, I don't want to enter a thousand names. I'm going to enter three names. And then we're going to output those three names. So let's see what this says. Enter a student name. Chris, Tim, ooh, I screwed up. Uh, I know what I did. I didn't screw up. When I move the window, let me just refresh. Yeah. When I move the window, it created a little quirk from one screen to another. If I keep it here, I refresh the page. Bill, Tim, Sarah. So now, to, now we've declared an array. We've put data into the array using a loop. Of course, what I'll do is the same thing for the output. For let i equal to zero, i less than students dot length, i plus plus, students. Now let's output document dot get element by id result students sub i again that way instead of hard coding the number i is just a variable that changes every time through the loop so it's the same process declare your array put data into the array output that data out of the array so let me pull this over here, kind of refresh the page. Han, Solo, and Chewy. Now, I broke that somehow. I keep wondering if it's that quirk that I was calling. Han, Solo, Chewy. There it goes. What happens is I open the window on one screen, then I drag it over to another screen, and that does something weird that, that isn't uh, really a bug. So we use loops with our arrays. This part right here, I imagine after a three-hour lecture, it's probably like, okay, I'm losing some people a little bit on this because if you didn't understand the loops fully, then you didn't understand the arrays fully, uh, tying them together is just not going to happen. Um, you can kind of see adding values into an array. We did that. We used the array.length to tell us the number of elements in the array or the number of things inside of an array. Here they're using one of those accumulators to add values from an array into an accumulator. Okay. Again, I gotta stay. I gotta stay an inch deep, but a mile wide on this one. Okay, so that was a pretty long lecture. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop it there. And what I'll do is stop the recording here.